Caroline Brock interviews Jesus on the subject of Mormon religion. The interview took place in Philadelphia, USA on the 20th of July, 2012. This is session one. Hello, my name is Caroline Brock, and I am interviewing Jesus today. Uh, we are in the States, in Philadelphia, and I am a Mormon, and I'm interviewing um, Jesus on Mormonism and how Mormonism was started. Um, I am currently a Mormon right now. Um, I was married in the temple. I went to BYU. I, um, I teach classes at the university on the Old and New Testament, and um, I... I'm still married, and my husband holds a high church calling, as does my father and my father-in-law. And I do respect, uh, I respect the things that they've learned through their church callings, and they've really blessed my life. And today I'm going to be uh, interviewing Jesus so that we can learn some more about what he thinks about our religion and how it was started. Yeah. Um, Welcome, Joseph, Carolyn. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, Joseph Smith who's the founder of Mormonism, mm -hmm. when he was in Nauvoo, he said that um, one of the grand fundamental principles of Mormonism was to receive truth mm -hmm. um, wherever it comes from, to receive truth. Mm -hmm. Within our religion, we feel like um, we, we have a pretty good handle on how to receive truth, mm -hmm. and we feel like we know how to discern truth. Mm -hmm. How do you discern truth in your life? Well, can I just rewind a little... Carolyn, yes. um, firstly, if you you could say that almost every religion on the planet feels the same way about truth. So, so they feel that um, they have discovered the truth through a certain process that they believe is the process that you learn or discover truth. And so every religion on the planet that's ever been um, constructed by man has all had this underlying goal, you know, in its pure form, to discover more truth. The, so, so that's not unique to the Mormon religion or any other religion on the planet, really. The problem is, a lot of the times, that uh, truth starts to come through, not through a process with God, but rather through a process of discovering it themselves. So what they do is they come up with some ideas or concepts, which they uh, really, in many cases, seem to pull out of thin air, and then because the concept has a degree of logic in it, but more importantly, has a large intellectual and emotional appeal to a certain audience, that audience then begins to believe that that particular thing is truth. So that's a very, very different process than the process that I feel we need to engage. What we need to engage is somehow connecting to the creator of all truth, the source of all truth, and then through the process of connecting with the source of all truth, that we all individually can receive truth from that source. That means then that we don't need a mediator to receive truth. We don't need some person who is a channel or a mediator talking to God and then reflecting that uh, communication to the rest of mankind because the reality is that all of mankind, whether we're in the spirit world or on earth, have the ability to correct, connect to God directly. And once we can connect to God directly, then we don't need to be told what truth is anymore from any other person because we'll learn it very rapidly through that connection with God. So what I started 2,000 years ago was teaching people how to begin and grow a connection with God rather than teach them other truths. I was focusing firstly on how to receive truth through that connection with God. And I feel that's a very important difference. Um, many people um, feel that what I'm telling them is truth or, or error, depending on their perspective. But the reality is when a person comes to a connection with God, they eventually finish up having the same feelings that I have about certain truths. And the reason why is because God can connect to all of us individually and tell us the same truth through that connection. It's just So then the question really becomes, how do we connect to God? Which is really, how do we receive truth from God? 
And that is through the process I've been describing, which is a process, firstly, of learning to be completely humble, secondly, being open to truth, whether it's external or internal, and then thirdly, and most importantly, being open enough to receive divine love so that the soul gets transformed into its ability to absorb truth. Because the main reason why the hu humankind cannot absorb truth is because we have emotional impediments which prevent us from absorbing higher truths which could be given to us by God or by other people even and, and yet we reject them because of our certain emotional impediments or our belief systems and emotions that cause us to reject things as truth. Great. So that's the process that I'm describing to mm -hmm. people and I feel that's the same process whether you're a Mormon or whether you're a Christian of any type, kind or whether you're a Muslim or whether you're mm -hmm. an atheist or whether you have any background in religion whatsoever you still have the ability to eventually connect to God through that process. Uh, what do you in general believe are the qualities of eternal truth? Are, they, are there qualities that that are right across the board is similar? Yes, and perhaps we, we probably need to um, separate that as a completely separate discussion because okay. uh, um, at some point I'll be giving a, an interview to a group of people about the qualities of truth. Okay. I feel there are you know 20 or 30 primary qualities of truth, okay. um, all of which um, are very different to what mankind thinks. And if I can maybe list a couple of them which, which impact upon this discussion. One is that many people believe that once you've received the truth, you won't have to modify it in the future. And to a certain degree that is true. But um, obviously if God is the owner of all truth and God is eternal, then it would make sense that there is an infinite amount of truth available to us as humans. Now, because we have a finite mind and a finite soul, a finite ability to understand, um, it would also make sense that no matter what we currently believe the truth to be, that at some point in the future we're going to have to modify that as it will be more refined as we get closer mm -hmm. to the infinite truth that God actually has. And so I feel that is one primary thing to bear in mind in this discussion, as it would be in any other religious discussion about any religion, is that, is that we need to bear in mind that each religion, any religion that believes itself to be the only owner of truth, is automatically out of harmony with that one principle of truth or quality of truth, and that is that the truth is infinite, and so therefore there is no one owner of truth um, in terms of uh, stability. We need to grow in truth. Mm -hmm. I'm, I am saying, though, that God owns all truth. I'm not saying that any person, including myself, owns all truth, because to own all truth, you would have to be God herself. So what we want to do is encourage people to understand that one of the qualities of truth is that it is infinite, and therefore, being infinite, it also will mean that at some point I will have to change my opinion mm -hmm. and, uh, and so will everybody else who is ever growing towards God will always have to learn to finish up changing their opinions quite, ra quite frequently, mm -hmm. in fact. Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Um, Mormonism began when Joseph Smith at age 14 went into a grove of trees and prayed to, and asked what church to join. Mm -hmm. And there are different accounts of the first vision. Mm -hmm. But the official one has God the Father and Jesus coming down and introducing themselves and saying to Joseph, don't join any church. Uh, in your view, what is the possibility of this occurring? Well, firstly, we need to understand the background of what was happening. Um, and I feel this is where many people on earth don't understand spirits. And Joseph Smith himself, when he was on earth, did not understand spirits either. So what that meant was two people in the spirit world could appear to him and claim to be God and Jesus. And, uh, and he, because of his undefined viewpoint of what spirits are and what mm -hmm. they're possible to do and what their potential power is and so forth, he would then potentially misinterpret the information as being from a source that's not God or Jesus but from some alternative source. And the reality is that the majority of religions that have had some kind of inspiration from appearances or visions have all begun in the same way. In other words, they've all begun with spirits in the spirit world who want to teach a certain pr group of principles or laws to a group on earth, and they feel that their particular principles that they've learnt in the spirit world are now more the truth than any other, 
they will often uh, come to uh, an individual such as Joseph Smith, present themselves to be something. They don't necessarily say they are that particular thing, but the person on earth then interprets it mm -hmm. as being those particular people, God and Jesus in this case. And then the person is very, very open to the transmission of the information and therefore the reception of the information and the recording of the information. And this is what's happened to Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. There were two spirits in the spirit world who believed themselves to, and they know who they are, um, they believed themselves to be um, influencing Joseph Smith in the right direction. Mm -hmm. They knew that Joseph Smith interpreted them, interpreted them to be God and Jesus, but they did not correct that interpretation. Mm -hmm. And then they opened the way for, for Mormon to, to deliver the what he believed was the truths, uh -huh. the set of truths or the set of guidelines and principles to Joseph Smith through this transmission medium of, of, of what many people refer to now as channeling or mediumship or, or many of people view it as prophecy as well. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in his case, he viewed it as prophecy, mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a, him being a prophet, which he, which he was, by the way, um, just not a prophet motivated by the spirits he believed to be motivated by at the time. Okay. Yep. Um, Mormons often, so along these same lines, Mormons often reason that either Joseph Smith was a complete fraud mm -hmm. and that he wrote the Book of Mormon himself and that he lied about all these things or that everything that Joseph Smith did came directly from God. Yep. Um, that's their reasoning. Yep. It's, it's kind of an all or nothing. So what you're saying through this is that there's another way that this could have happened based upon exactly. a, no, a greater knowledge of how the spirit world exactly. works. And in fact, those particular spirits involved who began Mormon, the Mormon religion, who began it in the spirit world, not on earth, they know this, the process that was involved with Joseph Smith, and Joseph yeah. Smith himself now knows the process that was involved. And this is why many Mormons still have uh, some difficulty resolving what process was involved because many times some of these spirits come along in a state of truth and influence the people on earth to start to see that there maybe is a third alternative and that is that we have a relatively sincere man in many respects, Joseph Smith, who was quite open and desirous of communicating and actually worshipping God and as a result of his openness he was quite open to being influenced by some people who believed there was a specific way that he should worship God and and he was quite open to receive their particular directions. And as a result of that, they came, appeared to him. This established the openness even further through this mm -hmm. through these visions and, and realizations and these experiences, spiritual experiences that he had. And then he would since he was so open, he, this information could be transmitted to him. It, it doesn't mean that he was a fraud in the sense that he did experience it. The reality mm -hmm. is he did experience many of the things and most of the things that he said he experienced. And the spirit, he, he just misinterpreted many of the spirits who were interacting with him. And he now, since he has passed, knows the truth about which spirits it was that were interacting with him at the time and, and what their underlying goals and motivations were. Just as those spirits always knew what their underlying goals and uh, motivations were. Um, God does not communicate directly through voice to any human. Con human. That is one of the uh, things that most people on earth do not understand. So every time that any person on earth believes they hear a voice coming from God, it is not from God, but rather from a person in the spirit world who, who is portraying themselves either to be God or allowing the person on earth to believe that they are God in the transmission of the information that they have to give to them. And uh, there are many voices claiming to be God which are very dark and, uh, and very, very malicious and actually cause people to murder others and kill others. And there are many voices claiming to be God who are less um, malevolent and are more benevolent. They're still not completely truthful. Mm -hmm. Because if they were completely truthful, they would never claim to be God or allow the person they're communicating with to claim to, to claim that they mm -hmm. are God. But the reality is many people on earth uh, do interpret these interactions as being sort of God-like type interactions, which are very 
emotionally uh, overwhelming and overpowering, which they then believe is an actual experience with God. And then they utilise that particular experience as the justification for them to continue to communicate with those particular spirits. So I can see how some people would say, "How does God? why does God allow this to happen? Is it because he started uh, this, how you were saying in another video that, um, that I think it was 160,000 years ago, that he, um, that God allowed spirit interaction with the earth? Yes, it was very many hundreds of thousands of years ago that God allowed spirit interaction with the earth. And it happened soon after Ammon and Amand, the first okay. human couple, uh, went through the degradation of their moral condition. And, uh, and as a result of that, um, spirits passed into the spirit world, people passed into the spirit world, and then begun this process of open communication. Now, God allows communication between anyone. So this is the thing we understand. when Many times when people say, why does God allow spirit communication? Well, God doesn't see a spirit as a person different to any other person on earth who can communicate okay. via their voice. So for that reason, God allows communication between any person, any human that has ever lived and ever ever will live, will actually be able to communicate uh, whenever they arrive on mm -hmm. earth and start this process of incarnation on earth. They will actually be able to communicate with anyone. Whether that person is malevolent or benevolent, the mm -hmm. person they're communicating with, will depend entirely on the feelings and emotions and the different belief systems in the person themselves. Okay. So that is completely determined, not by God, but rather by the person's own condition. And we can see this happening on earth. So, for example, if you and I decided we wanted to go along to uh, a place where we could drink a lot of alcohol and get drunk together, um, then you can see um, I would attract a person, if I was wanting to do that, who was willing to do that with uh -huh. me. Now, now, you being a Mormon, you probably wouldn't want to get drunk. And, and so um, when I invite you to come along and get drunk with me, you'd probably say no. Whereas if I invited another person who was happy to get drunk every night or every week, then he'd probably say yes. And this is the underlying principle that's contained in the Bible, which is about associations. We attract the people mm -hmm. we associate with. And it's exactly the same with spirits. So Joseph Smith attracted these particular spirits to communicate with him through a process that engaged, that engaged all of his current set of belief systems at the time, mm -hmm. as well as his current emotional condition at the time, some of which you know, was quite sexualized in nature, some of which was quite uh, male-based chauvinism in nature, some of, a, of which was a desire to actually connect with God and a pure desire to connect with God. And some of it was his pure desire to have more truth in his life. And it's a mixture of all of these mm -hmm. particular emotions in him and belief systems in him that caused the particular attraction to that group of spirits who portrayed themselves to be God and Jesus initially and then later Mormon and, and then give him a, a set of information that he could then turn into some kind of religious practice. Okay, great. Um, it is the belief of Mormons that the Book of Mormon was brought forth to um, help gather the 12 tribes and to prepare the world for the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us your understanding of where the Book of Mormon came from and mm -hmm. um, how it came, came to be, who wrote it? Um, it's very important to understand, firstly, that um, the Book of Mormon um, did, the people who were behind the Book of Mormon in the spirit world, did have some sets of beliefs uh, that they had already established quite firmly within themselves as to being what they believed to be the truth about God, the universe, and, and religion mm -hmm. generally. Now, this specific set of beliefs included some, some quite, quite strong beliefs about the Israelite nation, and, uh, and that, that was a part of these belief systems, and also some quite strong other beliefs in other different areas. And as a result, some of the beliefs that they transmitted to Joseph Smith were, were very much an inflection of their own very strongly held belief systems. And other beliefs were more what I would classify as generally principled in nature, where it encompassed a lot higher belief systems than that. The reality is that God has not selected or chosen a group of people. There are many groups of people on the planet who wish to believe God has chosen them. 
But God desires a relationship with every single one of her children. Therefore, it would make sense that God doesn't choose one single group of her children in order to distribute truth. That being said, there are certain groups that have been more open to God in the past than other groups. And there are certain races of people who have also mm -hmm. been more open to the belief of, of one God than other groups of people. And those particular groups of people, it has historically been a bit easier to transmit truth to than others. And as a result of that, God has used the spirits in, a, in this inter interaction with the people on earth who are more open to receiving some of these truths. And Joseph Smith was one of those people, but he's one of many, many people over a long, long history of hundreds of thousands of years on the planet where truth has been received by spirits through the same process. So we need to then go and say, well, okay, many of the so-called belief systems of the Mormon religion must be then the actual opinions of the spirits involved and do not necessarily represent God's opinions. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if we see ourselves all as equal, which uh, I feel is the underlying truth that we need to understand with regard to all of God's feelings about all of her children, from God's perspective, we are all equal. We are all equally able to receive her love. We are all equally able to engage him in this conversation and engage him in this interaction and relationship. That being the case, there is no one specific individual or person, including myself, who has ever been favoured by God through this process. However, the persons themselves have demonstrated certain desires and passions. And some people on earth have certainly demonstrated a much stronger desire and passion to connect to God than other people. Mm -hmm. And historically, I have been one of those people who have demonstrated a very, very strong desire to connect with God and therefore learnt how to connect with God and I could share that with others. But, but that doesn't mean that I'm the only person who can connect with God in that same way. Any person on this planet can connect with God in that same way. So from that sort of aside, we can see that this interaction that Joseph Smith had was that there was a feeling in him that he wished to create a favoured people on the mm -hmm. earth. And this wish was also present within the spirits who communicated with him. And then they used the analogies which he had previously read about in, the, in Bible scripture uh, regarding the 12 tribes of Israel. And, and this was certainly based upon some of his interpretation, his personal interpretation of the book of Revelation. And as a result of that, he then started to feel that he, you know, he was going to create this special people for God on earth. Mm -hmm. and, and that in itself is an underlying error because from God's perspective, there are no special people for God on earth because everyone is, special. everyone is special for God. Yeah. And if you desire to be close to God, then that process is That process started. has already started and can be engaged more fully once you know how to engage the process, which is a very simple process that a child can understand. And we do not need a very, very large group of uh, belief systems or, or, or theories or philosophies mm -hmm. in order to, to engage this process with God. One of the things that I know Mormons would say about this idea of being chosen or being more, certain people being more advanced is that, um, th is that, that we've been taught that there is a pre-existence where people... A priesthood. A pre-existing priesthood. Is that no, what no, right just or? a pre-existence uh, before we came to earth where we were, we were taught and, and we were given some choice in, in a pre-existent state that then determined where we ended up in this, in this life. Although in our own religion, in our own scriptures, it says that once we pass, we will not, remember, we will not yet remember anything about that pre-existent state until mm. a later date maybe of the and, final judgment. And this, was the, this, was a, this belief system was actually caused by a group of spirits in the spirit world trying to philosophize and work through these issues of reincarnation in compared to incarnation and then how it affected the Christian faith or Christian religion. And as a result, they tried to mix many of the principles together. Mm -hmm. The unfortunate thing of doing such a thing, though, is that you finish up diluting truth in the process. 
the reality is that the majority of people on this planet, or everyone pretty much who has ever entered this planet until very recently, and even then there's been very few, but until very recently, every single person who's ever lived on this planet has never had a pre-existing conscious condition. Mm -hmm. They've had an unconscious condition uh, because God created all souls and, and then the, the souls before they incarnated have an unconscious condition of their own position and the only re right way that they can gain consciousness is by incarnating. That's why God created the process. So God created this process of how we become an individual by actually creating the process of incoming to the earth and having an experience where we gather experience through life. And in the process of gathering experience through life, we come to see, you know, understand God, but mm -hmm. we also come to understand ourselves and understand our will and understand love and mm -hmm. understand many things through this experience. So, so God created that particular process for every single soul that God's ever created. And, and every single soul will go through that process the first time. Not every single soul will ever, will ever come back again. Um, and because many of them will not want to. In fact, the majority of them will not want to because there are many more powerful experiences they can have in the what you would call the spirit world or you know the afterlife than what people on earth are pa currently capable of experiencing. And for that reason, many people will never come back to, mm -hmm. to the planet after they've been here once. But there are spirits in the spirit world who believe in reincarnation. And many of those spirits tried to influence Mormon, the spirit Mormon, who in the belief systems that he had regarding the emergence of the Israelite faith, the Jewish faith, the Christian faith, and these other teachings that uh, he was discovering through different people that were all seemingly something that was quite well and generally accepted. As a result of that, many of the teachings that he came up with amalgamated mm -hmm. these particular teachings together put them all together in a melting pot, if you like, and tried to come up with some kind of intellectual explanation of all of these different teachings and how it works. And this is the reason why many people in, in the Mormon religion believe they had a previous life that they can't remember. In, in well, it, it's more of like a previous existence as yes. a spirit, yes. yes. So it is still Earth, a previous just, life. Yes, yeah. yes. And uh, the reality is um, when they pass into the spirit world, they still can't remember a previous yeah. life. And the reality is they have not had one. Uh -huh. and, uh, and they come to terms with that sooner or later once they pass. And as do many people who believe in reincarnation eventually come to terms with uh -huh. the fact that they haven't been reincarnated, often many hundreds of years after they've passed as well. It's the same with all truth from God, is eventually we eventually. come around <laughs> yes. to God's position, uh, which is actually quite a simple position and a very loving position mm -hmm. in, on, in every case. And so while God's truths are infinite, and therefore um, we have an infinite amount of truths we can learn, many of them are quite simple to understand once uh -huh. we learn them. Well, and we have this belief that this life is a test. But if we had a loving God and we had a pre-existence where we learned all these things, why would he erase our memories and then bring us to a test not prepared with any type of memory? Well, yeah, and this is one of the big problems with many of the pro the principles that are based in Christian belief systems and in and reincarnation belief systems is that many of them are not very logical and then also not very loving when uh -huh. you examine them. And so, yes, you, you know, you're right, raising those particular issues because the reality is there's not much logic there. There also yeah. portrays a God to be quite a harsh God. Um, but in addition, um, I feel it's driven a lot of the times by a feeling that there is in humanity that we do need to grow. Uh -huh. There is this underlying pure feeling that we all have that we do need to grow and learn how to love and learn how to be uh -huh. more truthful and honest and engage qualities that we currently don't have within us. And so there have been many religious forms created on the planet who have all come to terms in their own ways with this underlying principle of being forced into growth, if uh -huh. you like. And, uh, and the reality is all of God's laws cause us to grow if we mm -hmm. engage them, and particularly when we engage them in a loving way. They all cause us to grow positively. And if we engage them in, a, in an antagonistic and rebellious way, they all finish up causing us to slide down a, down a slope into a lot of evil acts. Um, and many people on the planet have looked at this good and evil and come up, tried to come up with an explanation as to why uh -huh. it's happened. 
and uh, and the Joseph Smith explanation of why it's happened is as good as any other explanation, although not truthful, mm -hmm. is as good as any other explanation from all sorts of religious faiths and beliefs and non-religious faiths and beliefs on the planet. Okay, mm. great. Um, with the Book of Mormon, there's different books written supposedly by different people. Yes. And one of them portrays... Um, one of them portrays Christ coming down in that interim space between death and resurrection. Um, and did you ever visit any other peoples after, after your resurrection? Um, after my resurrection in the first century, I visited millions of people on the planet. Um, obviously, I was always concerned with, uh, with visiting people where I, could, where I could give them some kind of connection with God through the process that I'd been teaching when I was on earth. And I also visited uh, millions and millions of spirits in the same manner, and I was also involved quite heavily in teaching large groups of spirits in the spirit world. So when I find a sincere person in any location, whether they're on earth or in the spirit world, I always attempt to engage them in some way with regard to you know, helping them come to understand what the truth is. However, I did not uh, channel the material to Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. So so he connected to a different spirit other than myself in this particular case who claimed to be myself because it had some kind of power and, and the spirit themselves sort of um, had emotional reasons why they wanted to mis, you know, misrepresent themselves. And then they transmitted certain particular principles and, and ideas and concepts to Joseph Smith. Now, I wasn't present when that occurred, and the reason why I wasn't because I, I'm generally never present when I find untruthful things occurring. And so um, I, I, I only know through discussion with these particular spirits what actually happened and, and also have a good understanding as to their emotional reasons why they chose to take this particular process. If you look, though, at the Book of Mormon, it is an, it's an ensemble uh -huh. of many different spirits coming to speak with Joseph Smith. Uh -huh. All of them had a very similar set of belief systems, and for that reason, they could appear one after the other to him. Many of the other books of the, of the world that are the holy books have, a, have actually been constructed in exactly the same way. The Bible itself is, in fact, exactly the same as that, where you have prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so forth, and all of those connected to different spirits and just channeled information over a period of time. Some of them channeled information from different spirits through their life and that become a part of the Bible canon. The same applies to the Koran and many other holy books, particularly uh, Hindu books and so forth, have all been constructed in exactly the same manner, where a spirit has appeared to a clear person on earth who was channeling this particular spirit. The, the person on earth then had the mechanism or means to write down them what they had channeled and was very dedicated in doing so. And through that process, you had a whole religion presented to earth. And almost every religion that's ever come to earth, barring the uh, what I taught in the first century, has come using that method. So, as far as the Bible goes, so what you're saying is God never directly, was never directly involved in a, in a group of people. He was never direct, or, or does God... Um, what I'm saying, influence a spirit who then influences a person? No, what I'm saying is God is directly involved with every person. Right. Directly, but doesn't take a group of people to a prophet who then disseminates information. Um, no, God often does uh, allow that particular thing to happen so that more truth can be presented to the planet. So, so many of the moral truths that have been presented to this planet mm -hmm. would never have come to the planet with any other method because people on earth were often in a very degraded condition, they were quite evil, and it took somebody who had a desire to, to go rise above the uh -huh. evil and become a good person themselves. And once they rose above the evil and became a good person themselves, then spirits in the spirit world could, could distribute to them higher truths. They're not the actual truth that God has, but, but they are higher truths. Now, the reason why the person on earth needs the intermediary is because they're not connected with God directly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, in my case in the first century, uh, it, I was connected with God directly. So I didn't need the intermediary between myself and God. And this is what I'm also teaching every other person, is that every other person on this planet who's ever lived 
um, does not need an intermediary either between themselves and God. Rather, they all they need to know is how to communicate and have a relationship with God directly. Once they know that, then all truth mm -hmm. from the universe, can, they can absorb all truth. Now, the only reason why all of us don't do that is because we it requires quite a lot of personal dedication, personal desire for love, personal desire for truth, personal desire to be good, as the saying goes, um, and morally and ethically good inside of yourself before you can enter this relationship, this relationship with God. And as a result of that, it's quite often uh, very difficult for most people to enter a relationship. And so what they do is they seek substitute relationships. And the substitute relationships are with a group of spirits who they hope know more about God than they do, mm -hmm. or whom they believe to be God themselves. And okay. sometimes those spirits don't um, claim otherwise. And as a result, the person who's interacting with the spirits believe they're God, but unfortunately, all the time, they are not. They are just okay. spirits who, who are masquerading, or not even masquerading. Many of them um, are totally willing to tell you the truth um, if you ask, but they, if you don't ask, then they don't tell mm -hmm. you. Okay. And that's, uh, that's the case with these particular spirits. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Um, Mormons believe that Peter, James, and John came down in spirit mm -hmm. and ordained um, the ancient priesthood on Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. And we believe that the keys of the Aaronic and the Melchizedek priesthood, that we have those keys. And because we have those keys, this is we see this as our proof mm -hmm. that we are an authorized church of Jesus Christ's authorized church on earth. Mm -hmm. um, we believe that these keys that, that um, you came down originally and um, gave these keys to your apostles, but they were lost through unrighteousness. And that's why we call ourselves a restored church, mm -hmm. because because of these priesthood keys. Mm -hmm. Well, firstly, can I state categorically that uh, I never created any priesthood in any area of the spirit world or on earth. Okay. So um, I don't believe personally in a priesthood. So the actual Jesus has never created a priesthood, nor believes in there being the need for a priesthood. Okay. Because by definition, a priesthood is like a, a, a go-between, uh -huh. or a priest is a go-between between a group of people and God. And there is no need for a go-between because God wants to have a personal relationship with each of her children and therefore does not need a go-between. So, so I am not a go-between, nor is any, anyone else who claims to be one a go-between between God and man. This is very important to understand. That being the case... Can you see how Joseph Smith's belief systems, which were firstly based upon the Bible, uh -huh. and therefore he had some understanding that Peter, James and John, who, who did uh, appear, uh, who were with me when the transfiguration event, which is an actual event that did occur in the first century on earth, um, happened, um, they then believe that Peter, James and John had held some special significance mm -hmm. in my own love as well as in God's eyes. The reality is that Peter, James and John all had specific emotional injuries at the time. They all were just men who happened to, to have the blessing of being, of, of being present at an event. This event was an event where I, through this, inter this relationship with God, and two spirits uh, in their relationship with God, demonstrated that they had now become at one with God through and demonstrated the power of being at one with God. And Peter, James and John could now see that they saw this occur. Mm -hmm. And so therefore they were in this very favoured position, uh, fortunately so for them, through their choices. Uh, but it wasn't because they were specially favoured as individuals or God had chosen them as individuals, but rather it was based upon their choices that they had made at the time. Peter, James and John were, were very um, desirous of following um, me, not always my teachings, but often desirous of following me. And as a result, they got to be present at an event that, that other people weren't present at, just like many people today um, are present at events that I'm sharing them with that other people aren't present at because of their own choices and decisions. Now, that being said, there was never any special approval or, or role given to those three men. 
And in fact, Peter afterwards uh, did many da damaging things to his own soul. And once he passed into the spirit world, he actually passed into what you would know as the hells of the spirit world or into a dark condition in the spirit world because of his choices. James and John passed into a bit better condition in the spirit world. But even so, they still had much progress to make in love before they became at one with God. They just happened to be present mm -hmm. at the transfiguration. That being the case, there was no such thing as the keys to a priesthood or a priesthood lineage of Aaron and Melchizedek. And these were old Israelite teachings based upon spirits that, uh, that then perpetrated these particular teachings on earth. And, and these were incorporated into the teachings that were given to Joseph Smith by these spirits. So you can understand, like, from Joseph Smith's perspective, he was just given all of this information. And of course, he didn't know for certain it was true from his own experience. Mm -hmm. And so he trusted the spirits that were giving him this information, mm -hmm. believing those spirits to be connected with God and connected with myself. Unfortunately, much of the information was not true. And unfortunately, uh, he, they weren't connected with God and myself, except through occasional connections that they had when they were in, in sincere place of desiring truth or desiring love. So, so I've, I've met, met many of them since, and, uh, and I've had discussions with the founders of the Mormon religion in the spirit world who talked to Joseph Smith, and many of them have now found the truth since. But uh, at the time, they channeled information that was a mixture of truth and error to him, and he accepted it because of his openness to mm -hmm. accepting it. It seems like if I were Joseph Smith, I'd have a lot of of grief associated with the fact that I would have almost felt like duped into something that I thought I, I put myself out there and my whole life was dedicated to something that I thought was yep. was God and now I found out that it's someone else's kind of uh, agenda. Yep. Every single person who has ever been used by a group of spirits in the same manner that Joseph Smith has been used usually goes through that emotion where they feel, you know, duped or misrepresented to, you know, lied to. And unfortunately, there's usually a group of emotions they experience before them that are like a chain of events. Mm -hmm. The first emotion they usually experience when they pass is that they want to hold on to the reality that they believe. Mm -hmm. So they often spend quite some time in the spirit world doing that, holding on to what they believed to be true. Then over a period of time, people interact with them and eventually it be, they start to know a different story, the actual truth, if you like, of what actually occurred. And Joseph Smith now knows the actual truth of what has occurred to him. Um, and then they go through an emotional process. Usually this emotional process usually begins with uh, surprise initially, mm -hmm. then anger, and then fear because they become afraid of, well, what's the truth then? And then they often feel a lot of grief that they taught other people uh, something was true when it wasn't, and then they feel a deep desire generally to correct that untruth. Now, Joseph Smith hasn't completed that particular process yet, but the spirits, many of the spirits who taught him have completed that process. In other words, many of the spirits mm -hmm. who taught him have been very interested in... in correcting the untruth that they perpetrated. And this is one of the reasons you and I are having an interview. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll find actually many Mormons are open to uh, new truths as a result because there are a, a group of celestial spirits now who used to be of the Mormon faith on earth um, who have learnt the truth and therefore want to share that truth with other Mormons as well. Okay. By the way, that same process occurs with all uh, other religions as well. There are many Muslims and there's many uh -huh. Christians who have now, after arriving in the spirit world, learned the truth. And they are they coming back to earth and trying to help. share that mm -hmm. with others too. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, so ab about this priesthood power, um, men who are ordained to this power, they are able to call down blessings from heaven. They're able to give blessings of guidance. They're able to heal people, they're able to cast out evil spirits. Mm -hmm. um, I, for one, have been the recipient of blessings like this, and I can attest to their power, and yes. also to, um, I, they have benefited me in my own life. So, um, so can you enlighten us to kind of what's going on there? Sure. It's very easy to understand what's going on when you understand the interaction that Joseph Smith had, and therefore 
the interaction with these groups of spirits. Because there is quite a large group of spirits in the spirit world who taught Joseph Smith these particular, let's call them truths in quotation mm -hmm. marks, um, what happened was that uh, these particular spirits then had to establish this truth through what I would call signs. And this happens very much with groups of spirits, where groups of spirits get together and decide together through a decision process where they all agree that they would like to demonstrate the power of, the, of the, their own power, which, by the way, all come to them from their condition of love and uh -huh. not from their teachings, okay. which many of them do not understand. But they are able to be in a certain condition of power, which then allows them to share this power with mm -hmm. others and mm -hmm. this power to heal the power to give visions, the power to actually cause people to go through emotional experiences are all part of these powers that every single spirit of a certain condition of love has. Mm -hmm. And then the higher condition of love you have, the higher power you have to mm -hmm. affect people in this way. So the greater the greater condition of love, the greater power. Now in this case, the condition of love which was better than and is better, the condition of love of these particular groups of spirits, is better than most, almost all people on earth. Mm -hmm. And for that, in, in, in the sense that they have a love for other people, they care about people, they want to share truth with people, and these are all very high ideals which cause people to have a much better condition of love. Since they have a better condition of love, they then are able to share this love mm -hmm. and also the, its results or fruitage with the people on earth. And, uh, and because many of the Mormons are open to receiving these particular mm -hmm. feelings and particular experiences, it is a great method that they can use to, to solidify the faith of those particular individuals mm -hmm. on earth. So what the spirits do is there's a, there's a two-fold uh, thing generally that they are trying to achieve. The first is that they're trying to share their love that they have with particular people on earth who are open to the experience, so that's one part. And then the other part is that they feel through the sharing of this love and through this particular spiritual experience that the person has that, that it will solidify their particular belief system. Mm -hmm. and, and Christians have the same experiences, Mormons have the same experiences, Hindus have the same experiences, mm -hmm. Buddhists have the same experiences. And if you actually analyse every religion on earth, you'll find that this underlying thing occurs in every religious faith. And the reason why is because the, the particular people in the spirit world want the people on earth to hold on to that particular faith and therefore having an experience which solidifies in them mm -hmm. the faith causes them to maintain that religion for much longer than they possibly would otherwise. Right. Uh -huh. Okay, so this idea of ordination, because something this is something important in our religion that, that you know we have this Peter, James and John to Joseph Smith to then it's like this everyone is tied directly to that event. Mm -hmm. Is there any sort of um, law or something that the spirits think in that ordination connects? Like when my husband gives a blessing, it, because of who he's ordained through, does that tie up to the people in heaven or is it just directly, do you know, does it just directly kind of go up to anyone? Every single one of these experiences ties up directly to the people in heaven who okay. are willing to give the particular experiences to the people involved. So, yes, it, it, they are actual experiences. They are just not experiences from God. Okay. They are experiences with other people who are in a bit more powerful conditions of love, who we're open to receiving information or feelings yes. from, that we then have this chain of events. Okay. Now, when you think about it, there is a hierarchy involved in what you describe, is there not? Yes. And what I've just stated earlier was that from God's perspective, there is no single hierarchy. Uh -huh. In other words, God has just as much love for any one of her children as, as he does have for me. Uh -huh. so, so for that reason, um, there is no hierarchy, and I'm not even a part of a hierarchy. Of course, though there are people in the better conditions of love that are worth listening to than other people. So so it's a bit like saying, would you listen to a person who wants to inspire you to murder or would you prefer to listen to a person who wants to inspire you to do good? Now, some people are perfectly willing to listen to people who inspire them to murder. Just today there was a shooting here in the USA uh, where 12 or 13 people got killed uh, in a cinema um, showing the Dark Knight movie 
And that was totally inspired by a spirit who wanted to inspire the young man involved to murder. Mm -hmm. And also there are spirits who want to inspire us to good. Oh. And uh, the spirits who tried to um, assist Joseph Smith, they had certain emotions that they were holding on to that weren't so good, but they also had certain desires to inspire Joseph Smith to good. And as a result of that, um, like any other religious faith on the planet, most of us, them are inspired to good in some areas and, and not inspired so mm -hmm. well with goodness in others. And it's this feeling that all of the religious faiths have that there is some kind of separation of faith through this process that is the error. The unfortunate thing is that through this process of thinking that there's a priesthood and thinking there is a hierarchy and thinking there is a hierarchy of distribution of truth, we are firstly misrepresenting God. Uh -huh. Secondly, we are teaching an untruth. And thirdly, we're creating separation and division. We're actually stating that a group of people on earth are more favoured than mm -hmm. another group of people on earth just because they belong to that group. From God's perspective, the person more favoured is the person who desires a connection with God. Mm -hmm. And the person less favoured is a person who does not desire a connection with God. From God's perspective, God desires a connection with all of her children. Now, if we look at that very simple perspective, we can see that all of a sudden we can rub out many beliefs of many religious faiths, including the Mormon faith. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I can see how sometimes, let's say, let's say you're a priesthood brethren on, on earth and you're giving a blessing and you're thinking it's coming directly from God. I can see how you almost think it's your own holiness with God that is creating it. And so... Which I, is establishing almost this... Uh, if you think about it, this uh, feeling of superiority over another uh -huh. that is existing within yourself. And God doesn't is establish superiority. And in fact, God cannot connect to a person who mm -hmm. believes themselves to be superior. So, And even if you don't feel superior, you might feel that this, um, this is something that means that you are holy yourself. Yes. Instead of you doing the work to connect with God and to receive divine love. And I can see how in the first century... When you said, when the people came and said, well, I've done all these things, I've healed and I've cast out death, why, are, why aren't I not with you? Mm -hmm. And then you said something about um, you workers of iniquity, which means that it's just a dysfunctional way of dealing with this I idea about God and that it will never get you, giving blessings every day will never get you any more divine love inside of you. No, and, and this is uh, something that we all must understand sooner or later, and that is that God wants a connection with the individual that connection has to be based on sincerity and pure desire mm -hmm. without sincerity and pure desire and I, I would classify any desire to believe ourselves to be holy is an insincere desire God created us all to be down to earth individuals and uh, God created a lot of things that a lot of holy people believe are is un, are unholy mm -hmm. as holy holy things. For example, God created sexuality, so therefore sexuality is holy. So, so the reality is when we look at man's interpretation religiously is that we have a desire to be holy. Now, why do we have this desire? It's driven by an underlying emotion of making us feel good about ourselves when we don't. So what we need to do instead is just feel bad about ourselves until that's finished and then we'll realize that there's no need for me to be holy. I can just be myself and I'm already holy in that place. And, uh, and so we don't have this concept of holiness versus unholiness. And unfortunately, in the spirit world, there are many large groups of religious spirits of all denominations of religion from the planet who all believe themselves to be holy. When unfortunately, once they start connecting to God, they believe that, well, in a way, we're all holy because we're all God's children. Uh -huh. and, and, and really what makes us holy is the love that we have. That's, mm -hmm. that's the real holiness. And uh, we can't fabricate that love. We mm -hmm. can't, uh, and we can't misuse it. We can't believe it to be something that it's not. And this is all something that needs to be addressed in every faith on the planet. Great. Something you said just in your response about feeling bad about yourself, if you were just to be honest about that. Mm -hmm. In, in the Book of Mormon, we're taught that the Spirit of God or that things of God um, will entice us to do good continually, mm -hmm. and they will entice us and invite us to do positive things, mm -hmm. and um, things that uplift ourselves and things that uplift others. Yes. And we believe that um, when we do these things, they're good for us physically and spiritually. Yes, 
And I agree completely with that. Conversely, we have teachings that say that evil or the devil invites us and entices us to do things that are negative and things that would depress us and things that would make us feel down and discourage us. Yep. Um, when we're talking about repentance and when you're speaking about going back and fully experiencing some of the negative emotions, mm -hmm. I can see how some Mormons would feel like this was counterintuitive to their concept of what God is trying to, to achieve with them. Yep. Can you speak to to those concerns? Well, let's not uh, let's be very careful about what the process of dealing with negative emotions is, okay. rather than what uh, uh, compared to what uh -huh. a lot of people believe it is. Yes, dealing with negative emotions doesn't mean that we actually embrace them and do what they demand. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, you know, if I have an anger within me that I need to address, and I'm angry with you, that anger might initially demand that I yell and scream at you. Now, now that that is not experiencing an emotion. That is experiencing the effect of an emotion. The effect of an emotion of my own fear, which is covering some grief within me, obviously, that caused me to fear and then want to suppress this fear by using my anger. So the reality is, once I experience the underlying emotion that's in me that causes me to jump into rage, I would never jump into rage with you. I would always be calm and kind and considerate in every dealing with you. And it didn't matter what you did. You could belt me in the face and I'd still be kind and considerate. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Once the emotion is out of, out of me. So I agree with the Mormon faith in that uh, when God is constantly trying to lead us into good things. Mm -hmm. Because every time we engage a loving deed and a loving feeling, we are actually growing in love. And therefore our soul is growing and expanding. Conversely, every time we embrace an evil deed, an evil desire, um, our soul is contracting and, and destroying itself and others oftentimes. Mm -hmm. However, I don't believe that it's the devil who made you do it. Because what actually happens is that once you understand emotion, you begin to understand that there are emotions inside of us that we try to suppress and keep under control. When we suppress these emotions and try to keep them under control, they finish up guiding a lot of our lives in a negative direction. So for example, if I have a lot of pain from my childhood about how my father treated me, then I will have a lot of anger towards men generally. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Or I'll have a lot of fear towards men generally and do whatever they want me to do. One of the two generally mm -hmm. trains of, of actions is what I'll take. Now. If an earthly person comes along and influences me to do something evil and he happens to be a man, there's a high likelihood, if I'm afraid of him, that I'll follow his direction. Now, if that emotion was not in me and I had a feeling that I wanted to do good, it would be impossible for that man to influence me in any direction negatively. So mankind, what's happened to mankind is mankind has embraced their negative emotions that they've denied and emotionally they are now driven by them into doing more and more evil deeds. And then what they've done is they've tried to come up with a reason why they did that. And so they constructed the devil. Somebody who's coming along and telling them that they should do that. Mm -hmm. Rather than acknowledging that this evil emotion exists within them. Mm -hmm. And the evil emotion, while it exists within them, will probably dominate their actions and their words mm -hmm. and, and their desires. And, and the only way for it ever to change is that the evil emotion has to come out of them uh -huh. without them embracing the act the uh -huh. evil emotion demands. So when we deal with causal emotion, when we're trying to work our way, as some people call it, process through emotion, we need to be very careful that we don't do what the evil emotion demands, mm -hmm. but rather just feel the reason why the evil emotion exists. And once we feel that through completely, that evil emotion will not exist in us anymore and therefore will not demand of us to do anything that's unloving. And we can automatically become more loving through that process. So something that, that Mormons have been trying to do is just try to be as righteous as possible. Yes, and, and most religions do the same. Don't yes, they? Yeah. <laughs> but in righteousness, if we, we think if we don't do anything wrong, then we believe that then Christ won't have to make of that much of a difference. And so, which is partially true in some ways. If we uh -huh. if we if we use the word Christ to, to to understand that as a person who has received divine love to the point of becoming at one with God, 
So if we look at Christ as God's love flowing into the individual, then the reality is that if we choose to do actions that are positive and not embrace actions that are negative, it's going to mean that it's a lot easier for us mm -hmm. to understand what love would do. Mm -hmm. So that is a definite truth. Um, however, it doesn't mean that Christ is telling us to do what's loving uh, because it's still an, an act of our will. We need to mm -hmm. embrace our will to engage with love. And we can do all of these things that are seen as righteous, mm -hmm. but if we don't deal with some of these other things that are hurts that none of us become here completely, none of us operate without any unhealed emotions or any anything that that all of us have things to work on. Yeah, if we can understand if we're how running that away happens, from those, yeah. then we're just being prideful, really. We're that's, not we're not looking at them that's like correct. that. Yeah, we're not being humble. And so it doesn't matter how good we are as far as what we do if we're not willing to be humble enough to see some of these other things that God continually shows us in our lives. Exactly. So so if you look at the underlying way in which evil emotions enter us, we, we incarnate purely. We are a pure soul at the point of the time that we mm -hmm. incarnate and, and begun this process of individualization. But right at that moment of conception, our parents already have extreme amounts, in many cases, uh, of unloving emotions within them already. As a result of that, they have unloving emotions towards other people, men or women. They have unloving emotions in terms of their beliefs about God. They have unloving emotions in terms of their beliefs about how to, of the environment and so forth. And as a result of that, those unloving emotions begin to enter us. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, by the time we're born, we already have some. And then as we grow, we act in harmony with some of those emotions. And then that causes a degradation of our own condition. That's how the evil got inside us the first, at the first point. Mm -hmm. So if we look at how to remove it, then it's the opposite of that process, which is we've got to start identifying the unloving emotional causes within us that, we, that cause us to act in an unloving way and begin to address them. Now, it's not addressing them if we decide to actually intellectually deny they exist and then just act lovingly mm -hmm. because that doesn't address it. And this mm -hmm. is why many people... And, and, and if I can give some illustrations of that that affect perhaps the Mormon religion. But uh -huh. so, so, for example, let's say a person in the Mormon religion um, happens to have a desire to, to, to commit adultery, let's say. Okay. So he knows from his faith that that would not be a morally pure thing to address, to do, to actually act upon. Uh -huh. so, but he feels the feeling inside of him, right? Yeah. So what he does generally is he fights against the feeling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So rather than the sort of embracing the feeling and feeling the feeling without acting upon it, exactly. he fights against the feeling. He feels a sense of guilt about the feeling. Mm -hmm. And then he fights against the feeling, which actually suppresses the feeling even further and therefore probably will actually guide more of his interactions. So he'll be feeling drawn to look at women all the time uh -huh. that are not his partner, for example. And he'll find himself looking and then he feels bad about it. And then he, and then he kind sings of, a song, distracts himself. Distracts himself, kind of tries yeah. to run away from that. Uh -huh. But the feeling is still there. If instead of doing that, we take this much more direct course of actually addressing the feeling. Then, and actually working our way through emotionally, why do we have this feeling? Once we release the feeling from us, we will never feel like mm -hmm. we wanted to have, you know, engage in sexual immorality with another person. We wouldn't even feel drawn to look at uh -huh. the person. And this is why I said in the first, first century, century yeah. that anybody who's even looking at a woman in a lustful mm -hmm. manner has committed adultery in his heart. Because there are the emotions in his heart mm -hmm. that are still present there that would cause him to actually go ahead and commit the act. What I feel is the problem with many religious forms on the planet, including the Mormon religion, but also most Christian religions and uh -huh. most of the Muslim faith and all these other faiths, is that they believe they can be righteous without having a righteous heart. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they believe that they can be righteous, have righteous actions, without actually getting rid of the emotion that causes yes. the unrighteousness within mm -hmm. their heart. If instead of doing that, they address the unrighteousness in their heart and re release the unrighteousness from their heart, then their heart is purified and they'll never feel drawn into the unrighteous act. Mm. And the Book of Mormon does teach some of those things. It talks about being lowly of heart and, and humbling yourself and things. And it actually, there are several instances where it does talk about divine love. Mm -hmm. um, but then we're never taught how to do that. Exactly. And so if humility is never modeled 
then it's, it, I think what it turns into is people intellectually repent. Exactly. And that's what I've been doing so, exactly. so often. It's just, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to think, oh, that I was know so what bad. I did was and wrong. now I'm going to, yeah, and now I'm going to pray and yeah. sincerely say, I'm so sorry. And if it never gets to your heart and you've never seen, let's say your parents go through this process, or you've never had someone come up to the pulpit and say, wow, I've, I've really been working on this emotion and I've, I've really struggled with this. And this is what I've, if you've never once seen that, but just seen people standing up there acting as though they're perfect and acting as though everything that they do is perfect, then yeah. You don't. There's no. There, there's no frame of reference for how to how to start on that process. Exactly, and and also guilt has a large bearing, doesn't it, on the whole process? Because many times we feel that guilt is repentance, uh-huh. and they are not the same thing. Yes. A lot of times we we notice our own guilt. So in other words, we feel the unloving desire that mm-hmm. that is present within our soul or within our heart, and we feel the urge to act upon that particular desire. Uh-huh. But then we notice that intellectually and we go, um, oh, that's not a very nice desire that we have. That's really out of harmony with love. And then we go through this process of feeling guilty that we have a mm-hmm. desire that's out of harmony with love. And then we're so focused on the guilt, unfortunately, uh-huh. that we are not willing to actually go into the emotion more deeply and understand why we had that desire, Mm -hmm. where did it come from, and what inside of me do I need to remove so that I never Mm -hmm. have that desire again. And I feel that uh, all religious faiths on the planet need to understand a different method of operation. Instead of being driven by guilt, by the guilt, guilt and and actually trying to suppress the emotion Uh through their guilt, which is not the same as repentance, they need instead to go through this process of rooting the cause of mm-hmm. the emotion, the, the actual thing that creates this desire that, that's within mm-hmm. them, it's out of harmony with love, root that out of themselves through a process that's actually going to hurt emotionally. And once they do that, they'll actually not have the emotion mm-hmm. present in them that causes their particular unloving de- desires, and therefore it will be very easy to be loving mm-hmm. And they won't have to go through any guilt because they'll already be loving and therefore have no guilt. And and I feel if most religions on the planet understood that particular process, they'd be relieved actually yeah. of a lot of guilt and also a lot of their un, their their burdened hearts. Mm-hmm. At the moment, many of them have a very uh, their internal dialogue, if you like, inside mm-hmm. of themselves is very damaging to their own worth because they constantly go, well, why are you so bad like yes, this? Why are you so bad? Yes, beating themselves up. And beating yourself up for mm-hmm. being so bad rather than looking at, okay, there's mm-hmm. an, the, all this is is an, a bad emotion within my heart that got there through uh-huh. the process that I can actually embrace and release through a process. And once it's gone, I never yeah. have to engage it again. Yeah, I see yeah. that in my own children. Sometimes I'm trying to teach them something and some of them spend more time beating themselves up over the fact they made a mistake. Exactly. And they don't ever get around to learning the thing I'm trying to teach them. And I don't, I'd rather just teach them and move on. Yep. yep. And I'm sure that's how God exactly. wants to be with God, us. He doesn't want yeah. to just beat us up. That's right. God has no desire uh, for punishment. However, God does have a desire for correction. So, uh-huh. so therefore, God does not want us to keep punishment punishing for ourselves. Punishment's sake just for the sake of being punished. And, and, and all it does, in a way, all punishment does is assuage your own guilt. Uh-huh. So, so all it's doing is saying, I'm guilty, now I need to be punished. So now that I've punished myself, I I'm no better. longer guilty, uh-huh. I feel better. But in fact, nothing has changed because the actual cause as to why you've done or that evil deed or that you had that evil thought that you mm-hmm. had has not been removed from within you. And, and it's very important to understand that we can remove Mm -hmm. all evil thoughts and evil desires that are within us. I feel there's a big, strong uh, uh, understanding in many faiths that it's impossible Uh to be perfect, to become perfect. It's impossible, therefore, they believe, to actually remove any evil that's present within. And all many religions believe is that you can suppress the evil. Uh You can't remove it. I'm saying to people, and I have said right from the beginning in the first century, that God's love will eventually remove all evil through this process or it will engage a process where you have to remove all evil Mm -hmm. from your soul quite naturally. And all evil can be removed. And that's why I said in the Bible, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect Mm -hmm. because in the end all evil can be removed. When we punish ourselves and and feel guilty all the time and have this guilt-punishment, guilt-punishment cycle... What we're doing is actually suppressing 
that process. the underlying evil desire that's present. And therefore, it is going to happen again at some yeah. point in the future. It is unlikely to not happen again unless we have a very strong will. Okay. Yeah. So in our religion, we're taught repentance is a process of confessing either to God or to a priesthood leader, depending on the severity of the sin, and then forsaking the um, action, mm -hmm. which is also dysfunctional because it doesn't actually take into account any of the things course. inside. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. So, so while those two things are involved in the process of repentance, the reality is there are many more things involved yes. in the process of repentance that okay. are necessary if we're truly going to no longer have that evil desire that's Inside present within the heart. Okay, mm. great. Yep. All right. Um, in the Mormon faith, we are told that... Um, we after reading the Book of Mormon, so someone who's coming and and who is a investigator, we call them, yeah. um, to tell we tell them to read the Book of Mormon and at the end to pray with uh, an, a sincere heart and ask if the Book of Mormon is true, mm -hmm. and if they get a confirmation um, from the Spirit, we call it um, of warm feelings or of um tingling it could be sensations. tinglings mm -hmm. or a flash of insight mm -hmm. or something uh, uh, otherworldly mm -hmm. um then something this that's is a, a, sort of like an experience yes, yes then this is a confirmation that that the religion is true and yeah. that the book of mormon is true and that it all comes from god and that this whole philosophy of mormonism and what we think about everything is coming from the holy spirit mm -hmm. what are your thoughts about that well, again, it relates back to how the Book of Mormon got created in the mm -hmm. first place. Um, when we have a group of spirits who are very interested in perpetuating a certain truth or belief system that they have created, they then engage people on the earth in a series of actions which improve the process. And we've just had a bit of... Noise. I don't think it's actually from here. I think it's from somewhere else in yeah. another room. It sounds like a screen being... Yeah, it does actually. We'll see whether it continues. Um, so, so if we go back to the, the uh -huh. question. So we have a, a group of um, spirits who are now desiring, intensely desiring, to perpetuate the belief system. They, of course, want the belief system to grow on earth mm -hmm. rather than to be degraded through some kind of process. So they, they are engaging this process of wanting it to grow. So what they do is they encourage the personal experiences to occur. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And the personal experiences are things like these tingling sensations and all these other uh, other sensations that occur through the process that occurs. The, the beauty of doing this from their perspective is that every single person that engages that particular process will be convinced, mm -hmm. at least for a short period of time, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll be convinced that what that process was was an experience with God a spiritual experience that, that validated their belief system. And like I said, this happens in all other faiths too. So unfortunately, you've also got, uh, besides Mormons, you've also got Christians who are going through the same process who then have these valid, validating experiences. You've got Muslims who also go uh -huh. through exactly the same process. You've got Hindus who go through the same process. So of course, all of these religious formats just get perpetuated on earth because they, because nobody understands where they come from. Mm -hmm. They all believe that it comes from God. And however, God doesn't work like that in the sense that God hasn't got three minds about something. God's got one particular opinion, and uh, and the reality is, if there are whole different, completely different belief systems receiving the same kind of acknowledgement from a so-called God it would make sense that it's probably not the God that's the one God that created us, but rather mm -hmm. somebody else. The reality is that there are spirits involved in the perpetuation of these particular belief systems, and as a result of their desire to perpetuate it, what they do is they engage these processes with the individual and in fact encourage them through, te mm -hmm. through the teachings so that the individuals involved in the teachings have these particular validation-type experiences which then they assume to be something that it's not. Okay. And that's what's occurring for, the, for many in the Mormon faith, just as it's occurring for many in every other religious format on the planet. Thank you. Um, it is our belief that the Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, is the third member of the Godhood. So we have Heavenly Father, mm -hmm. and then we have you, mm -hmm. and then we have the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And that its role is to guide us in our daily lives and to be a companion to us. So after we're baptized, we 
um, we have something where the priesthood brethren lay their hands on our head and they confer upon us um, the Holy Ghost, or they say receive the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. um, and and our the onus is on us to live a life of righteousness so we, we can feel the promptings of this um, Holy Ghost and that it can... Um, it will always lead us in the right direction. What are your thoughts on that belief? Well, again, it's a mixture, isn't it, of, of what I would believe to be, and what I know from my own experience, to be truth mixed with some error. Mm -hmm. the, the problem for many people is that they don't understand the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, and, and they therefore misinterpret it. Um, if we look at the so-called teaching of the Godhead first, shall we? Sure. There is no such thing of the Godhead in the sense of that three beings or individuals are a part of one God. There is God, my father and yours, uh, my mother and yours, and that God has created all things as far as I'm aware, uh, particularly in this universe that we exist, and, uh, and I can connect to this God just as you can because both of us have God as our parent, mm -hmm. as our mummy and daddy. And as a result of that, this God has a method of connecting to us. Now, the method of connecting to us is the interesting part. And that involves the Holy Spirit, what I would call the Holy Spirit. And I actually, I was the person who began this term, the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, in the first century, it wasn't uh, much of a thought before I spoke about the Holy Spirit, even though Bible translations now include it from the Old Testament. Um, they actually translate other mm -hmm. words into that, into that name. The reality is I coined the word for one particular reason, and that is that God has many energies or spirits. And when I say spirits, I'm not now talking about people who used to live on earth, but rather I'm talking about energies that flow from God. Okay. So, so let's call one of them the creative spirit, which okay. is the energy of creation that flows from God. Then there's a maintenance spirit, or the energy of maintaining the universe that flows from God. There's, there's many other spirits also that God has. There's a sexual spirit that God has, which is a, it forms a part of God's creation of the universe. And there are all these other energies. They are all just forces, if you like, energetic mm -hmm. forces. And, uh, and quite often in the first century, I used to refer to them like the wind. And I used to use the word that described the wind to mm -hmm. describe God's forces or energies. Um, so rather than calling them spirits, I used to call them forces or energies like the wind. Now, one of these forces that are like the wind is the force that controls the flow of love, and it specifically only controls the flow of love between God and a person on earth or in the spirit world. And this particular force I called the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. The reason why I called it the Holy Spirit is because it was the spirit or force that makes you holy. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. It causes you to become more loving, more truthful, more honest, more open in all aspects. And in fact, it causes your soul to expand and grow. And for that reason, it was the holiest force that you could connect to between yourself and God. So while you can connect to many other energies from God, and you can, by the way, there are many other forces that we can connect to from God. And many people are connecting to these forces on a daily basis. For example, there are some people on the planet who can live without food. And the reason why is because they are connecting to the maintenance energy, which they call prana or they give some term. But it's a maintenance energy that comes from God, that where God has energy that flows to all the universe, maintaining all the living things in the universe. There is also an energy of, of life that comes from God. And, and which and what people call the spark of life, and that is also another energy. But the holy energy, the Holy Spirit that comes from God, is specific in its role and operation in that it's the energy that transmits love from God to our soul. And it's an energy that cannot connect to us without us being in harmony with truth. Now, this is a very different energy than a spirit giving you some feelings. So when a person lays their hands on you and all of a sudden there's a force or feeling flowing through you, it is not this energy, but rather it is a spirit in the spirit world connecting through this connection and giving you their feelings, which is not the same as God giving you hers. When God gives you her feelings, you will generally end up in a mess on the floor, in the sense 
that you'll be very, very emotional. You'll be crying. You'll be experiencing many things as a result of God giving you the energy. And even when you become at one with God, it is a very engaging, overwhelming experience to receive more love from God still. And it's very tearful, joyfully tearful process once you've become at one with God still. It is overwhelming every single time. And it's not a gentle feeling at all in the sense that uh, it, it's a loving feeling, but it's not gentle in the sense that, it, you know, just a gentle tingling or something like that. Mm -hmm. These are the kind of energies that spirits give us. And, uh, and of course, what's happening when a person in the church, in the Mormon church, gives a blessing, most of the time it's because of the mm -hmm. spirit confirming through this process that the faith is the true faith. Um, when when it's not God's energy or God's Holy Spirit connecting with the person. Now, what you've described, though, as the role of God's Spirit is very important, and, and it is a true role of God's Spirit, and that is that while we can only receive love from God while we maintain a connection with God in truth, mm -hmm. and so the Holy Spirit can lead us through this connection to more love and also lead us to truth, to understand what the truth is, as long as we understand it. But that is not the same as a spirit giving us a confirmation of truth. So what happens for most religions on earth still is that spirits are giving them confirmation of truth. And that's why you can be in one religion and receive a confirmation of truth and be in a completely different religion with a completely different format and a completely different understanding and receive a confirmation that that's the truth. Mm -hmm. And that's because there are two different spirits giving that confirmation. These spirits are not God, but rather they are spirits who guided the actual religious faith. Does that okay. make sense? So as a result of that, it's very important to understand that most of these confirmations are not coming from God. If they were all coming from God, then eventually all of those people in all of those different religious faiths would have exactly the same opinion of truth on a single matter. Mm -hmm. the, re the fact that they are not all coming from God is proof uh, by the action that happens, which is that all of these people believe different things, and yet they receive the confirmation. However, if you were connecting to God, you would receive the same confirmation only. Mm -hmm. And this is the difference between receiving confirmation from the Holy Spirit in comparison to receiving confirmation from people in the from spirit world. Spirit. How does this relate to, um, let's say you're baptized and you uh, get confirmed and you truly want to seek God in your life. Mm -hmm. um, and then you start feeling prompted by a spirit. Um, can you tell us about the role of spirit guides and how they are, perhaps, um, their interaction between God and how that works? Sure. Um, this is, I suppose, where it becomes a bit confusing for most people of most religious faiths, isn't it? Because the reality is there are spirits in the spirit world who used to be of all of those faiths who are now having this personal relationship or connection with God who then connect to people on earth who are sincere and who are trying to guide those people on earth to God. So what those particular spirits do, or people, they are just people who used to live on earth, who are now in, in the spirit world. They now just don't have a human form in terms of a human body, a physical body, but they do have a human spiritual body. They still are half of a soul like they've always been. And, and they themselves have learnt about how to have this personal one-on-one -on -one connection with God. And so what they do, they, they don't care whose faith it is. They just care whether you have a sincere faith, a uh -huh. sincere desire to connect to God. And then what they try to do is they try to lead you to more and more truth about God so that you can have a stronger and stronger connection with God. The problem is, is that often our faith on earth towards a different religious viewpoint or belief system prevents us from uh -huh. going into that direction after a while. And thus our desire for God's truth overwhelms the desire for some uh, to uh, hold on to the belief. Truth, truth yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So so if I have a very strong desire to hold on to the belief system, and that could also be caused by the fact my family and friends Definitely. have a strong desire that we hold on to the belief system, that the world around me will condemn a different belief system and so forth. If I have a very strong desire to hold on to a belief system, then of course this particular these beautiful spirits who are trying to guide us to have the same relationship with God mm -hmm. that they have, um, they'll eventually be able to lead us a certain direction. But because our desire to please people on the earth is so great, what will happen is that they will choose to 
actually instead of doing that they, they, they're they trying to influence yes. us but but they can't influence any further until we're willing to confront some of these belief systems mm-hmm. and it's only when we're fully willing to confront every belief system mm-hmm. that they can actually help us the most because in that state we now are much more humble we are much more open to absolute truth god's truth to enter us and and in that place, we have a great capacity to grow. Mm-hmm. That's the place they're trying to lead every person of every religion into. Yeah, and the more you, even as you continually progress, you continually have to be confronting your belief systems because they will be refined and more refined Correct. and more refined. Because one of the qualities of truth is it's eternal and everlasting yes. and, and infinite. And therefore, mm-hmm. I will have to, through my process at some point, have to come to terms with the fact that I'll have to change what I believe to be true. Yes. And, and if all of us of any faith on the planet understood that one particular truth, mm-hmm. we'd all get along much better. We would all look at the loving teachings that are in every faith and we'd say, right, obviously these teachings are throughout every faith. So there's a higher mm-hmm. likelihood that those particular teachings are the truth about God. And then the, the teachings that are all not the same in every faith, we'd have to seriously examine because it, it, it would tend to appear if that's the case, that these are the ones that God can't agree with Mm -hmm. and only spirits who perpetuate those beliefs or people who used to have those beliefs on earth and who are now in the spirit world who are perpetuating those beliefs on earth still, that we need to perhaps give those up. Mm -hmm. And if all of the religious faiths on the planet did that, in the end, we'd all finish up with having probably no specific religious faith Mm -hmm. and instead all having an individual connection with God and interestingly enough, all believing the same thing about love as well. That would be a great place to live. It would be not only a great place to live, but a great experience for the planet, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, the concept of the atonement is very central to our doctrine, or what mm-hmm. we call also the atonement. Uh, we believe that Christ atoned for our sins in the Garden of Gethsemane, and um, that b- his atonement was infinite and um, infinite and everlasting. And we believe that this atonement satisfied the ends of the law. Um, but that being said, firstly, most Mormons um, readily admit that they don't understand anything about this infinite atonement because it's too complex and mm. uh, complicated for mm. us to understand. And secondly, we do also believe that... Um, that even though Christ atoned for our sins, we have to fully repent for all of our sins in this life or else suffer for them in the next life. Yeah. So there's kind of like a double... So it's almost uh, like a contradiction. <laughs> in, kind of, in, yes. Mm-hmm. Can you explain that that to us a little bit more? Certainly. The reason why... Can I explain firstly the reason for the contradiction? Yes. The spirits who per, who perpetrated the belief or, or initially gave the belief to Joseph Smith on earth... Um, had two particular conundrums to resolve. Firstly, they had this conundrum of of the underlying belief from the Bi- their Bible history, which was this belief that uh, that there was a sacrificial lamb who uh-huh. could take away the sin of the world. So there was that belief, which which was a fundamental core teaching Definitely. of Christianity. Secondly, there was a growing set of beliefs in the spirit world regarding reincarnation. Um, or regarding in particular an aspect of reincarnation which involves the, what's called karma or what the spirits know as the law of compensation. In other words, that if you do something wrong while you're on earth that you have to pay the results of what you've done mm-hmm. in the spirit world if you haven't already paid them on earth. And these two particular belief systems are often seemingly at complete opposites of each other. And so there are some belief systems uh, on earth that have tried to ratify and and pull together these Uh two belief systems. The Mormon religion is one of them that has tried this. Very few other religions have tried it as successfully, by Mm -hmm. the way. Um, And so what they've tried to do is they've tried to look at the law of compensation, which is this underlying principle of God that if you do things wrong, that there is going to be at some point some compensatory Uh action that needs to occur for what you've done that has affected your soul and the soul of others. Then there's this second thing of this whole idea or concept of the sacrifice, my sacrifice in the first century. This concept that their blood, the death of somebody, the blood of somebody, 
uh, that God has some kind of underlying meaning in the blood and the sacrifice that causes it to take away sin, to remove sin. And this uh, underlying belief was co constructed actually in, the, in hopefulness because there are many people on earth who realise that they sin and they realise it and also feel at the same time quite powerless to remove the cause of their own sin. And so what they do is they construct a belief system that tells them that somebody else can remove the cause of their sin mm -hmm. because they are not able to. And that was the whole reason why this underlying belief was constructed, that you could actually sacrifice something and, and therefore uh, cause sin to no longer exist. Now, the Israelite faith, the, the Jewish faith, had that going for many centuries, obviously mm -hmm. quite a few millennia, a millennia and a half around about before I came onto the planet. And so I, that was the uh, environment that I was brought up in in the first century. I was brought up in this environment where if you went to the to the temple, the Jewish temple, there was literally blood running down the sides of the temple um, from all the sacrifices that would occur in the temple. It was quite a smelly place to be mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes because of all of the dead animals that were being sacrificed quite constantly there. And it was also a very depressing place, I felt. Uh, when I was in the first century, I felt that it was depressing in the sense that all these animals were being sacrificed with this underlying belief that they would somehow take away the sin of the people yeah. and it had no such effect. The reality is the people sinned and continued sinning and, and their souls kept degrading and continued to degrade mm -hmm. whether they sacrificed the animal or not. Uh, it was a great way, though, of the priests getting some meat to eat. Um, because all of the uh, meat was consecrated to the temple and therefore consecrated to the mm -hmm. priesthood, which meant that the priesthood could eat the meat and uh, and therefore enjoy what many of the average poor people uh, could not enjoy, and that was mm -hmm. a steady diet of meat. In and they were the first things of the flock, so they were the best of the best. <laughs> exactly, it was the best meat. <laughs> it was the best possible meat you yes. could enjoy. So there were some ulterior motives on the part of the priesthood to, perpetu to perpetuate the belief. And the underlying creation of the belief was caused by this un emotion in people that they really do want somebody to come along and save them from what they could see they weren't able to save themselves from. Mm -hmm. The unfortunate reality, though, is that we can save ourselves from our evil emotions through a process with, of experiencing these emotions and working our way through them and receiving divine love, which actually refines our soul. So, so there is no need to have that belief. So that's the first thing. There's no need to have this belief that the blood of Christ... And why Christ... would God want our blood? It exactly. doesn't make any sense. There are many other philosophical problems yes. and logical problems with the belief as well, of course, which you know, we can go yeah. into at another time. But, uh, and, and many of those relate to God's own desire to love. Like, why would God place all of the sins of the world on one person, yeah. myself, and then cause me to suffer for yeah. those particular sins. That's like getting two children of your own and having the one who does all the bad things and then getting the nice good child and saying, right, I'm going to punish this good child mm -hmm. for everything the bad child does. Now, no parent in their right mind would consider such a, a and, thing. And would that make the bad child any better? Of course. You know, like, it's, it's highly not... unlikely that it would make them better. <laughs> it would just make them continue doing what they're doing, probably. And, and, and also, most probably, would also make the good child finish up turning out bad. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, there is a lot of illogical mm -hmm. uh, belief systems here in this, in this belief system. But it is driven by this underlying emotion. And this underlying emotion is quite simple, and that is... I do want somebody come along and save me from my own actions that are out of harmony with love. Now, unfortunately, no one is ever going to come along and save you from your own actions that are out of harmony with love. And in fact, God makes sure that every of one of your own actions out of harmony with love can only be reversed through one of two processes. One process is called the law of compensation. Some people refer to it as karma. And this is what you sow, you will reap. And you will reap it and continue to reap it until such a time as you decide not to sow it. Mm -hmm. right? And this is an underlying truth that I presented in the first century about God and all of the things that God does. The second teaching, which I feel is the most important teaching of the two, 
is the teaching that I first gave in the first century, which is this teaching of repentance. And the teaching of repentance is such that we can actually go through the emotional experiences of why we chose to do the unloving actions and take the unlo unloving actions we, we took and, and release from ourselves the reason why we have chosen to do it. And in that moment, we can be forgiven through this process of love entering us. We, the causal reason as to why we made these particular choices are erased. Now, God desires either one of those two laws, the law of compensation or the law of repentance, to act upon our soul to correct it. The law of compensation is, a, is an action that is forced upon our soul. Mm -hmm. The law of repentance is an action that we must personally engage through our desire if we wish to. If we choose to not engage the law of repentance, the law of compensation is the law that will be engaged. Yes. So that's the default position. Mm -hmm. And then the law of repentance, which is an act of divine love, is something that we can choose to engage. And that was the law I was teaching people. So John the Baptist, for example, taught the law of compensation, what you sow, you will reap. And I taught the law of repentance, what you sow, you will reap unless you actually go through the process of repentance about mm -hmm. what you've sown. And, of course, the law of compensation also involves repentance, but it doesn't address often... Well, it addresses through a very slow and laborious mm -hmm. process the underlying emotional reason why we chose to do what we chose to do. The law of repentance is a lot more honest with yourself. You have to see why you chose to mm -hmm. do what you chose to do and go through the process of releasing that from you. And that is the process that is the pro that is about receiving divine love as well. When you're in that place with God, it's amazing how rapidly you can address certain problems and situations in comparison to choosing the law of compensation. So there are many murderers, for example, in the spirit world who passed into the spirit world from earth, who, who used to murder on earth. And they have had to engage the law of compensation for each murder that they have undertaken. And they have chosen to not do that willingly, so they've had to go through a process. Many of them, two or even three or four thousand years later, are still going through the same process. Wow. But I know of other murderers who have engaged the process of repentance in the spirit world and who have, have gone through that process in a matter of years, in comparison. Mm -hmm. So one of these laws has the ability to transform our soul very rapidly, the other law has the, has the ability to transform our soul, but very slowly. And it's up to us which one we engage. So I feel that it does apply again to all faiths, but also to the Mormon faith. And this is the, the conundrum that they face, is that on one hand they're trying to engage one law um, or hope that I, my blood somehow saves them, mm -hmm. which absolves them from going through this law of compensation. And then on the other hand, they're saying they're going to have to go through the law of compensation anyway, which is, which is true unless they engage the law mm -hmm. of repentance. The only way I saved anybody, if, I, if it could be said to be such, was that I taught people mm -hmm. the discovery of this law that exactly. I discovered. That's the mm -hmm. only way that I'm saving anybody through it. And that is I taught people what I personally discovered, mm -hmm. this law of repentance. And I started to engage this law of repentance in a very active process myself. And in through that process, knew it to be true. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, taught that to other people. And other people who then engaged that process know it to be true as well. And I would encourage every person of every faith to engage that process. It doesn't matter Definitely. what faith they are of. Uh, and in the Book of Mormon, it actually says... Um, it says something like Christ didn't come to um, re save us in our sins, but from our sins. And one of the reasons he, how he does that is to bring angels down to show us the conditions of repentance. Not that we're going to somehow be magic wanded by you uh -huh, uh -huh. and suddenly change, although we're still living in that place of being away from God, but that we can learn how to do it ourselves, which is so much just what, as we've been talking here, I just have a feeling of so much hope and, Versus having this intermediary 
priesthood person having to do things for us or having this thing we think is working when we know it's not working in our lives. Mm -hmm. We know that we're not whole and no scenes are making us holy because if they were, we wouldn't be on antidepressants. We, our relationships wouldn't be failing. We, wouldn't, <laughs> we would be living so much longer. We wouldn't be doing all these things that we're doing. We yes. wouldn't be solving problems the way normal people solve our problems. Yep. So... It just seems like this this way is so much more loving and so much more logical mm -hmm. and puts the the ability to change on us if we follow certain things versus not, waiting and, until the next life. Yeah, waiting and not, until And not only that though, if you think about it, it gives you much more power over change. Definitely. Doesn't it? Like you know, I feel that's one of the problems with many organized religions is there is this underlying belief that change is not really possible, mm -hmm. so that we and therefore we need somebody else to come along and save mm -hmm. us. And and secondly, there is this underlying feeling that because change is not really possible, I've a sense of hopelessness about our own sinful condition. Mm -hmm. And and I feel a lot of religions have this very strong feeling of hopelessness inside of them that many people in the religion perpetuate and feel guilt about. Mm -hmm. And, and reality is we could remove all this hopelessness yeah. if we just understood the process of, yeah. that God has created for us to remove mm -hmm. sin from our soul. Yeah. All right. Um, and also talking about the, what you were talking about the um, atonement, we have an article of faith that says, we believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. What I find interesting is that if we said, we believe that because of the atonement, because Christ came first and showed us this, mm -hmm. that all mankind may be saved through obedience to the laws, not necessarily ordinances, because ordinances are just formal ways of promising to keep a law. Can I just correct though? Sure. All mankind won't be saved through obedience to the law. Okay. The way we actually, when I talked on in the first century about being saved, I was specifically referring to the condition of one with God which is what this atonement is all based okay. upon. Now, one with God is not achieved by obedience to law at all, in fact. At one with God is achieved by receiving God's love into your soul. Mm -hmm. That automatically causes you to be obedient to law, but it's, not, it's the result of at one with God that causes you to be obedient to law. You can't be obedient to law and not receive divine love and then expect to be at one with God. A, a one with God can only be obtained by receiving divine love mm -hmm. into the soul to the condition of a one with God. And and as a result of becoming in this loving state, you will automatically, automatically. be obedient to law. But if you're obedient to the law of um, repentance or humility, if you're using those laws and utilizing those laws, then shouldn't they also bring about the one if you're yes. using those in the right way. But it's not, if you think about it, it's not those laws themselves. That do it, yes, you're right. You're right. It's, those love, laws. it's God's love that yes. does the transformation mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the soul. Our humility mm -hmm. and desire for truth are important parts of assisting God's yes. love to the transform the mm -hmm. soul. Because obviously, if I'm not humble and I have no desire for truth, then I'm going to be re very resistive mm -hmm. to the principles involving love, and therefore I'll reject God's love, and therefore God's love will never transform mm -hmm. my soul. So, so, uh, but I feel it's very important that we see the distinction between the the process of law in comparison to the process of the transformational effects of divine love. It's the reception of divine love into the soul mm -hmm. that transforms the soul, not the following of law that transforms yes. the soul. Okay. A person can actually follow law and yet not receive love. That's important to know. And it's very important to understand that. And so we can act in harmony with the law, but at the same time not receive mm -hmm. love that transforms the soul. And unfortunately, this is what I find happening in many religions mm -hmm. on the planet. Many religions are... are are wanting people to embrace this process, if you like, of engaging the laws uh -huh. of the religions themselves, which are often also laws of God to a degree, you know, mm -hmm. the, what I'd call laws of love. But they are not willing or going through the process of receiving divine love into the soul. And as a result of that, they've got to try hard to uh -huh. act, do all the laws, as we said earlier. Whereas a person who's actually receiving divine love into the soul in actual fact 
doesn't have to try yeah. hard Wouldn't that to be practice easier? the law. It's a lot easier. I feel like that's what a lot of Mormons are doing. We're trying to self-mastery our way into heaven. Yes. And it's exhausting. It is exhausting. <laughs> and, and also there is a feeling of hopelessness that grows within the individual when they do that. And any time there is a feeling of hopelessness that grows within us, we must understand that it's due to us taking actions that are out of harmony, harmony with God's laws, mm -hmm. not in harmony. Definitely. So, so if I'm acting in a way that's trying to be in harmony with God's laws, and I'm becoming more and more personally exhausted through the process, then this is telling us that there is something wrong mm -hmm. with that particular process. And what is wrong is this underlying belief that we can transform ourselves without God's love entering us. And this is, a, this is an issue of self-reliance. Mm -hmm. Most uh, religions, although they say that they're God-reliant, are actually very self-reliant mm -hmm. in that they, they really believe that as long as they maintain the law, as long as that they law is right maintained things. and uh -huh. dealt with, they believe that uh, God will you know, respond to their desire to maintain the law and, and cause them to be in a saved condition. Mm -hmm. It's only God's love entering the soul that saves us or transforms us into the condition of at one with God. And if we understand that, then we'll certainly engage humility and we'll certainly engage the truth of the law, but we won't have that as our focus. What we'll have as our focus is our desire mm -hmm. for a relationship with yes. God. And our desire to love, mm -hmm. our desire to be transformed. And the reality is that all of God's laws that affect the human soul are all affecting the human soul to transform the soul. Like the law of compensation or the law of karma mm -hmm. is a law created by God to transform the soul. Mm -hmm. But the law of repentance does it much faster. It's a much faster law yes. to transform the soul. And God is constantly desiring our soul to be transformed into, into something that's higher and higher and higher and higher in condition of love. Because the higher condition of love we become, the more happier we're going to be, the more joyful mm -hmm. we're going to be, the easier we're going to find love, not harder. The, the easier we're going to find our life, the more harmonious we'll be with our soulmate, our, the mm -hmm. other half of our soul. And the more harmonious we're going to be with every other person and every other creation on the planet without trying. Mm -hmm. without having to go through this big effort every single time. So I sort of feel like if if all religions and, and if those of the Mormon faith can embrace that process and understand that it's not the law or following the precepts of a law mm -hmm. that caused their transformation, it's receiving God's love that causes transformation. Mm -hmm. And there is a process by which we can learn to receive God's love consistently and once we have that process and we know that process now we have everlasting yeah. eternal and until we learn that process why even learn anything else exactly that's what i find in this it's like it's ruined me for any other type of learning <laughs> i'm like yeah, why do i want to go any time i open a book i'm like this is yeah, yeah, there, right. there's just nothing else there's nothing else to search for or to or to put my whole effort in until I get this process right. Exactly. It, everything else is kind of just a waste of time. Exactly. Yeah. I was thinking we might have a break there. Cause I... okay. yeah. Just what I felt when I was filming was um, just this huge sense of relief and almost grief and like it, it sounded like I could feel crying, you know. Firstly, from the people who had been involved in, like, inspiring the Book of Mormon and, and inspiring Joseph Smith of this huge feeling of, like, finally, you know, the truth is being spoken and they've tried so hard in... To make a correction. To, to make a correction mm -hmm. in many different ways. And the, the feeling was just, like that it was so concise and I felt you guys were really quite concise with each other and, and that well that's what they felt I should yeah. say. Yeah. And so they were just like, oh almost like still going through their process of repentance, the grieving, mm. um, but also joyous crying of yes, it's finally being spoken and honour that this was happening with you and Because um, imagine what it would be like if 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 you'd been responsible for for perpetuating um, what you now know to be untruths um, 
and millions and millions of people now believe it and there's this millions and millions of people embracing it uh, every generation. Mm -hmm. Imagine what you'd feel like if, if at last somebody could come along on earth and actually say, this is what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the case with many religions too, that, that the actual leaders of these particular religions in the spirit world are just waiting for the opportunities to correct what's actually happened to their religious faiths over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So it's really wonderful that um, you've been brave enough to do the interview because it's um, the, the reality is it doesn't only benefit Mormons here on earth, but it benefits so many people in the spirit world in terms of their ability to be able to um, now make a correction. Mm -hmm. Just having this particular discussion on the internet means that every single one, one of those spirits can motivate Mormons of all all around the world to actually look at this interview mm -hmm. and, and examine it, whereas, uh, whereas before they had no mechanism on earth to, to actually correct these mm -hmm. particular things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if Mary just I'm goes just comes over, across then that way we can be yeah. in the just, same so. Just like I was um, influenced when I was typed in on YouTube, LDS, Plan of Salvation, and what came up was Secrets of the Universe. But what was surprising is that even I clicked on it because I never... I don't exactly. search YouTube. I don't. I don't browse YouTube. Yeah, I don't have yeah. time to do that. Yeah. You know. And I just thought oh, I'm going to listen to this guy until he tells me something that I know is not true. Yeah. And I'm still obviously <laughs> still listening. <laughs> yeah. So. And and you know again it would have been spirits who led you to that mm -hmm. particular choice and decision. And this is what I'm saying. Having having a very concise record of what's going on with each religion is very very powerful because what it does is it causes you know, this whole ability to then be able to um, correct from their perspective to be able to draw people to that resource mm -hmm. and, and correct the particular mm -hmm. perspective that they've been wanting to correct for hundreds of years now, you know, 100 years or so now, um, for some of them. And, um, and, and it's just a fantastic opportunity on a lot of levels, you know, to, mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah. Yeah, and it just needs somebody brave enough on earth to, to bite the process off. I think off, you're so know. brave. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. it's lovely you're brave enough. Yeah. Surprisingly, we have patriarchal blessings and um, it kind of tells you your, you know, your what. And at the very end of the blessing, kind of as though the patriarch didn't want to say it, he said, before the second coming, you will be working with Christ to help bind the human family together. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was really interesting. I don't know if that is coming to pass at this time, but I just felt like if that, what, in a, what other way would that be, you know, that that, that would be occurring? It's just and actually working with the person <laughs> yes. who is the Christ. <laughs> yes, to, to help the human family in their own dysfunctions be able to to, bring to come together. together mm. You know, be bound together in love and in truth. Yeah. Whereas before, they're all scattered and confused. And, exactly. And yeah. tr really, really trying, but and there's mm. a lot of these beliefs of hierarchy and these beliefs mm -hmm. of inequality in perpetrated in religion that creates these particular set this separation that occurs between humanity and. And, you know, once we start confront having a discussion like this about one faith, it's really a very, very similar discussion about a oh, lot of faiths that, yeah. are, that, are, that are now on the planet. And there are now something like, I think it's seven and a half thousand organised religions on the planet that are, that are more than just a small group. And, and if you look at that, you know, there, there's a lot of different faiths that will all benefit from a similar discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, you know, instead of there being interdenominational fighting uh, mm -hmm. and and religious fighting, and and historically there's been just terrible effects of this mm -hmm. separation. Like millions and millions of people have died in wars as a result of this particular problem. And so, if we can correct this problem, it'd be fant it's fantastic. Yeah.